This video is supported by Skillshare. So I was having a conversation the other day uh, with a friend of mine, a, a non-space nerd friend of mine, and we were talking about space travel and uh, SpaceX and the you know Crew Dragon and all that, and, and he was talking about what a what a disappointment space travel has turned out to be to him. Because, you know, we grew up seeing the space shuttle taking off on a regular basis, and it was this space plane, and it had cool names like Endeavor and Atlantis, and, and we would think back then about, like, in the early space program that people would just, like, land in the ocean in capsules, and it all seemed so, so primitive and, and quaint. And now shuttles are museum pieces and we're landing in the ocean again. Now, again, he doesn't follow space stuff like I do. Uh, kind of my job now, but uh, I have to confess that as excited as I am about Crew Dragon, as excited as I am about the, the private space race that's going on right now, I've got to confess, it, it, it does feel like a step back. The shuttles just felt right, you know? They were symbols of our expanding presence in space, of hope for the future. I've told this story before that when I went to Kennedy Space Center a couple years ago and I went to the Atlantis exhibit, um, you know, when they open the thing up and you first see Atlantis, you know, there for the first time, like, I had to take a second. I got, I got teary-eyed. I, I had so much love for this vehicle from when I was a kid that I, I didn't even know was there. The space shuttle program ended for a lot of reasons, but its core idea of reusability is more popular than ever. And for fans of space planes, that, too, is starting to make a bit of a comeback. Possibly sooner than you think. When you consider that the Saturn V rocket, arguably the largest rocket to ever take to the skies, was completely 100% thrown away at the end of its mission, it might be hard to believe, but NASA's had reusability in mind from the very beginning. Rocket pioneer Werner von Braun imagined reusable space planes making regular trips up to orbital space stations. He also imagined nuking Soviets with them. He was a Nazi. In fact, it was the Germans in World War II that came up with the first space plane concept. Uh, it wasn't von Braun, but actually a colleague of his, Ugen Sanger. It was called the Silbervogel, or Silver Bird. It was a lifting body aircraft that would be able to skip across the top of the atmosphere so they could rain bombs onto America like they'd been doing to nearby Britain. Luckily for us, it was never built, but you can see a lot of its influence in the X-15 rocket plane that set a record for fastest piloted flight that's still never been broken. And it was also kinda a spacecraft. Uh, 13 different flights of the X-15 went over 50 miles above sea level, and that's where NASA says that space begins. NASA's an American agency, so of course they have different standards than the rest of the world. The international standard is the Kármán line, which is 100 kilometers above sea level. That's 62 miles. Uh, NASA puts it 12 miles below that at 50 miles. The Kármán line was proposed by Hungarian engineer Theodor von Kármán. He was trying to figure out at what height the air would be too thin to support an airplane. It's not perfect, but it was good enough for the Fédération Aeronautique Internationale who decides these things. <sighs> Can't get away from French words lately. But the X-15 was not the beginning or the end for space planes, not by a long shot. There was the HL-10 from Northrop in 1966. It had some high altitude drop tests, but never quite got to space. Then there's the Boeing X-20 Dinosaur. Yes, that was its real name. It stood for Dynamic Soaring. It was first proposed back in 1959, and it was basically the Silver Vogel with an American coat of paint. It was meant to be a long distance surveillance or bomber plane launched from a Titan II rocket. It never got past the planning stages, though. The U.S. wasn't alone in wanting a space plane. The Soviet Union began planning for one back in 1957 for similar military reasons. Perhaps the most famous is the MiG-10511, which made eight subsonic flights before being retired after a crash in 1978. The Russians also famously built the Buran, which was basically their version of the space shuttle. That program was abandoned when the Soviet Union collapsed. It only launched once, uncrewed in 1988, but it did perform the first automated landing of a space plane, so that's pretty impressive. The European Space Agency developed their own space plane in the 80s called Hermes. It was quite a bit smaller than the shuttle or Buran, and it was designed to sit on top of the Ariane 5 rocket. In fact, the Ariane 5 was built specifically for this space plane. After the Challenger disaster, they decided to redesign it to make the cabin ejectable, which caused delays and overruns that eventually killed the project, although the Ariane 5 is still around. Back to NASA, starting in 1995, they were playing with designs for a crew return vehicle specifically to serve as a, an emergency escape for the ISS. What they came up with was the X-38. The plan was to have it re-enter the atmosphere, glide to a landing zone, and land with the use of a giant parafoil. They never got beyond drop tests, but the parafoil they used in a drop test in 2000 still holds the world record for largest parafoil ever used. It was one and a half times the wingspan of a 747. And of course, the Russians had their own version of this lifeboat idea called the Clipper, built by RKK Energia. It ran out of steam in 2006. 
So space planes have a long and frustrating history from space programs all around the world. Almost every space plane concept fizzled out before it ever got off the ground. Except for one major exception. And that, of course, is the Space Shuttle, which first launched to space in 1981, finally fulfilling Von Braun's dream of a reusable space plane after decades of development. Whole videos can be made, and have been made, on whether or not the Space Shuttle was a success or a failure. It's a complicated question. On one hand, it never really brought the cost of spaceflight down, which was kinda, you know, the point. It also didn't achieve anything resembling rapid reusability. According to Stephen Sullivan, a former space shuttle processing chief engineer, quote, the end of a mission set in motion a four to five month process that included more than 750,000 work hours and literally millions of processing steps to prepare the shuttle for the next flight. And of course, two of the five shuttles went down in spectacular fashions, basically a 40% failure rate across the fleet. And those two disasters killed 14 people, by far the most of any space vehicle. In fact, the total number of people that have died on space missions throughout all of space travel history is 18. 14 of those were on the space shuttle. But another mind-blowing fact is that the space shuttle flew 135 missions, launching 355 people into space. The total number of people that have been to space is just under 600. More than half of all people that have gone up into space went up on a space shuttle. So the shuttle program is flawed for sure, and the debates around what its legacy should be is going to be never-ending, but it did prove out the concept of the space plane. If done right, with better technology and a simpler design, a faster turnaround time, better safety considerations, you might have a vehicle that has all the benefits of the shuttle and the capsules. Kind of a best of both worlds thing. Enter the Sierra Nevada Corporation with their Dream Chaser space plane. SNC's been operating out of Sparks, Nevada since 1963, and I'm not gonna lie, peace and love isn't exactly their motto. Most of their work has been in the defense sector. But in 1994, the company was bought out by a longtime employee, Fatih Osman, and his wife, Erin, and in the last couple of decades, they shifted toward the private spaceflight industry, purchasing aerospace company SpaceDev in 2008. Some of the more high-profile projects they've worked on since then include building the engine for Virgin Galactic Spaceship 2 and working with the Dynetics company to build the Autonomous Logistics Platform for All Moon Cargo Access, or ALPACA, a landing system for NASA's Artemis program. The Dynetics lander design is in competition with Blue Origin's national team in the SpaceX Lunar Starship. The decision on that is supposed to be made on April 30th. But SNC's flagship is a lifting body space plane called the Dream Chaser, which was already in development by Space Dev when they got bought out by them. The Dream Chaser was actually a contender for NASA's commercial crew program, which produced the SpaceX Crew Dragon, which is currently in operation, and Boeing Starliner, which, uh... <laughs> yeah. The Dream Chaser survived four stages of the program, but got dropped in the final stage. Not a total loss, though. Those four phases earned them $363.1 million in NASA funding, which they've put toward their Plan B, which is to do uncrewed Dream Chaser flights for the NASA Commercial Resupply Services Program. They were actually given uh, awarded a contract for that in 2016. So they have the go-ahead to fly cargo missions to the ISS, and they're working toward that with their prototype vehicle, Tenacity. Tenacity is 30 feet in length, about a quarter the length of the space shuttle, and its wings fold up, making it small enough to fit in a standard size payload fairing, so this is a small vehicle. The payload fairing it's planned to go up in is a new Vulcan Centaur rocket from ULA, which itself is still in development, though a test article was recently delivered to Cape Canaveral. So far, Tenacity has aced a series of tests, including a 12,000-foot drop test. The plans were to put it into orbit for the first time this year, but since then, the first flight has slipped to 2022, pandemic and whatnot. Tenacity is designed to fly upwards of 15 missions before a major refitting, but it's currently only scheduled for six ISS trips. One major use case for the Dream Chaser is trash disposal. So Dream Chaser's cargo configuration has a payload capacity of about 5,500 kilograms, which is smaller than the uh, SpaceX Dragon, which is 6,000 kilograms. But Dream Chaser has a trick up its sleeve. And that trick is a disposable module called Shooting Star. It can carry 4,500 kilograms of payload up to the ISS, and then once docked at the station, can be loaded with their trash and then sent down to burn up in the atmosphere. <gasps> like a shooting star. The ISS is limited to two metric tons or 2,000 kilograms of trash storage, so this extra capacity won't go to waste. Or it will go to waste. <laughs> you know what I mean. Speaking of re-entering the atmosphere, the Dream Chaser uses tiles just like the Space Shuttle did, but it only has 2,000 tiles instead of the Space Shuttle's 21,000. 
Now that's partly because it's so much smaller than the Space Shuttle, but also the Dream Chaser's tiles are bigger. They're 10 by 10 inches instead of six by six inches. Now another advantage that the Dream Chaser has is it uses ethanol for maneuvering, which is non-toxic. The shuttle used hydrogen and nitrogen tetroxide, which is toxic, and which is also why when the Columbia burned up over Texas in 2003, the residents around here were all told to not go around the debris because it was dangerous. The Crew Dragon uses the same mix of chemicals, which is why if you remember back in August when Bob and Doug splashed down, it, it took a really long time to get them out of the capsule because they detected a leak and they wanted to make sure that it had dissipated before they got them out. That's also why it's a bad idea to approach the capsule on your little motorboats. But like, imagine if that was the case, if there was an emergency, say an astronaut needed emergency surgery or something, and they were coming back from the space station to get that surgery, floating around in the middle of the ocean for the better part of an hour is not a good situation to be in. You know, so again, we go back to the idea of a reusable space plane as sort of a lifeboat from the ISS. That's totally something the Dream Chaser could be. It could literally land on any runway in the world and medical personnel could be right there waiting for it, able to treat the patient the second they land. That is, of course, down the road a ways. If the cargo version of the Dream Chaser proves itself out, they could have a crew version in about five years or so, uh, because that's kind of what it was originally designed for. So with any luck, we could have a whole fleet of Dream Chasers serving the ISS and maybe some private space stations in the near future. Of course, Space Plane's been making bold promises from the beginning, as we talked about a second ago, so we'll have to wait and see how this whole thing bears out. But it's not just SNC working on space planes. There's actually several concepts in the works. In Italy, a team backed by ESA is developing the Space Rider, a lifting body space plane for cargo transport. The plan is to launch Rider and a fairing of a Vega C rocket. It'll carry microgravity experiments to orbit in 2023 and then land using a parasail like the X-38 we talked about earlier. The Indian Space Research Organization got the Twitterverse excited in 2016 when they announced a successful testing of a space plane called the RLV TD Hex 1. The 1 6 scale prototype of the production model, it flew hypersonic and reached a height of 70 kilometers. RLV TD is meant to be reusable, so it was a big deal when it landed autonomously, even though the virtual runway was underwater. The state owned China Aerospace Science and Industry Corporation has plans for a fully reusable two stage to orbit space plane. It's essentially a rocket that launches on a jet and then blasts off to fly the rest of the way. Another Chinese space plane may already have been tested in orbit in September of 2020. If rumors are true, it was carried in the fairing of a CZ-2F rocket, similar to how the Dream Chaser will launch in a Vulcan Centaur. We know an experimental spacecraft went up, we just, the space plane part is the rumor bit. But last but not least, there's the X-37, which is kind of the US military's worst kept secret. It got its start at NASA, and then it was handled by DARPA, and now it's being taken over by the US Space Force. Back when the shuttle was still flying, the X-37 was considered a vehicle that could actually go up in the, in the space shuttle's cargo bay, uh, which I would have loved to have seen that deploy. It would have looked like the space shuttle was giving birth. And this is an operational vehicle, technically the only operational space plane in the world at the moment. It's had six missions that we know of, with the longest being the most recent. It was in orbit for 779 days, just over two years. As for what exactly it's doing up there, well, the fact that it's classified leads to a whole lot of speculation. The official word is that it was testing out new ion drives and, and heat pumps, but uh, you know, if you just believe everything they tell you. Now, of course, it's possible that they're doing surveillance missions or testing new weapons, but I mean, we already have dozens of spy satellites up there, and it's also smaller than the, the Dream Chaser is, so probably couldn't rain a whole lot of death from the sky. But again, it's, it's a working space plane, so this is still a valid concept. So maybe the Dream Chaser or any of these others will be the thing that finally brings space planes back into fruition. I personally would love to see that, but if past this prologue, there's probably still a lot of hurdles in the way. But I guess time will tell. But let's say you want to design your own space plane. One way to bring that to life is this free open source program called Blender, if you've never checked it out before. And if you want to learn more about Blender, a great place to start is a class called Blender 3D, your first 3D animation on Skillshare. Taught by motion design artist Remington Markham, this class will teach you basic animation with Blender 3D and show you how to build and animate a character. You'll be guided through the basics of the interface and the animation process, and you'll learn how to optimize the workflow for speed and efficiency. Even if you've never used Blender or any 3D animation software before, you'll come out of it with a new set of tools to bring your imagination to life. This is, of course, just one of hundreds of courses you can take on Skillshare, covering all kinds of subjects like photography, but also photo editing, film and video production, graphic design, music, as well as productivity courses and business classes. Skillshare's online classes are super affordable at only $10 a month, but if you sign up and are one of the first thousand people to do so in my link down below, you can get a free trial of Skillshare Premium for a limited time. So shake things up. Try something new. There's a link down in the description. Go check it out. 
All right, big thanks to Skillshare for supporting this video and a huge shout out to the Answer Files on Patreon and the community members on YouTube that are supporting this channel and uh, making all this possible. I really can't thank you guys enough. Uh, I want to shout out some of the community members who have signed up uh, um, on YouTube. Let me shout out their names real quick. We've got Laura Ode Webb, Tony Hunter One, Wreckage Rider, Frojong Gorbachevson, nailed it. Uh, Andrew F., David, Sergio Perry, Jamil Khan, Chubby Chippendale, uh, Sammy Joe, Adam Prawl, Mr. Denver Sevy Jr., uh, David O'Berry, Carol Kohler, and Burton Miller. Uh, thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them and get early access to videos and exclusive live streams, there's a little join button right below this video on YouTube. Just click that and you're good to go. All right, please do like and share this video if you liked it. If this is your first time here, check this video out. Google says so, follow Google. There's also others down here on the side. If you're watching on YouTube, might have my face on it. Check them out if you enjoy them and you wanna see more. I do invite you to subscribe. I come back every Monday with topics like these. All right, that's it for now. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week. Stay safe, and I'll see you on Monday. Love you guys, take care.